So, uh, hello, my name is Oshin Gilmore. I'm not sure if you're able to see me or not. If you aren't, you should be able to see the uh, Dublin Commuters uh, screen there. Uh, so, I'm the secretary of the coalition, um, and I'm just going to introduce the meeting. Uh, the first thing I'd want to say is you're all very welcome, and thanks very much for uh, coming to this Zoom meeting. The second thing I'd want to say is that this is the first time that we are hosting a public meeting uh, via Zoom um, or any meeting via uh, via Zoom. So uh, this is all new to us. So if something goes wrong, uh, don't hold it against us uh, too much. Um, so the meeting is going to have three parts. The first is uh, Kevin, uh, our chairperson is going to introduce the coalition and say a bit about who we are and what we've been doing since we were established. Uh, after that, um, uh, Feldrin is going to speak a bit about what's happening at the moment and in the foreseeable future, uh, transport infrastructure in Dublin. And after that, we are going to uh, Simon and Janice uh, are going to speak about uh, the committee, uh, being members of the committee, what they can do and uh, how you can get involved. Um, so I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's about it. Um, um, also, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll be taking them as we go along. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's probably it. So over to you, Kevin. Yeah, that's, thanks very much, Shashin. Yeah, um, for uh, the removal of any doubt, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so to allow other people to view it after it's over. If you would like to turn off your camera now and not be included, we can cut off the very start of the video or we can hide your video if you don't want to be included. But I don't think uh, your video will show up based on the later the screen at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go through um, a bit about what we've done over the past year, because we're coming up to a year now since we elected the committee, coming up to two years since um, the whole thing was um, first thought up. So what we've done on the back end side of things is getting ourselves set up in a more formal structure. Because for a very long time, it was just me. And um, I'm very grateful and thankful now to have uh, a team of people working with me to um, achieve the, the aims and goals of the coalition. We've written and enacted our constitution, which um, gave us a, a framework of laws and bylaws and um, guidance on how we should operate and what we should do in certain situations. We wanted to get that uh, enacted first before we elected our committee, which we have done. Um, a few people you see, um, on the side there, I don't know, I actually, I don't know what you see. I just assume what I see is what you see, but um, you'll see a few of our committee members are here and the ones that aren't here um, send their apologies. We've also taken some time to um, clarify our online presence and some housekeeping. So that involved setting up the, the likes of Microsoft Teams accounts and, um, you know, OneDrive and, all, all the nitty gritty that goes into um, keeping all of our files and all of our knowledge and everything we're working on together and collated. Uh, and that takes, that takes a, a lot of work as well for uh, people who don't necessarily know um, everything there is to do with that. But um, that's what we'll be doing on the back end. Um, things we still need to work on are uh, a source of income. Uh, we still are working off our own our own pennies and whilst there may be many people willing to contribute and we're very grateful for that um, we still need uh, a way to um, receive that money properly and report on it properly and allocate it properly and that's something we still need to work on um, we uh, also are uh, in the process of being recognized um, in various forms um, we have applied to be on the Dublin City Council Public Participation Network. That was just before COVID and that's obviously been put on hold. Um, we highly doubt we'll be looking for higher charity status because it just isn't something that we will be looking for. 
We also need to clarify every um, structure and the system for our membership so that when someone becomes a member, you um, are placed in you know, a, a data protected database and we can um, contact you very easily and your status of your membership is clarified and the rest of that. That's a very, very complex process and it's proving very difficult for us. So um, we're still working on that. Um, hopefully once um, this pandemic is over, we'll be able to get that done as soon as we can. And we also want to start providing consistent updates um, to our membership based on what we're doing uh, at any given moment so you know monthly newsletters and the, and the like because at the moment it's very very heavily based on twitter and so we want to move on from that short sharp updates and more big bang updates every every now and again some of the things that we've done in the past year that have been very notable achievements for us our pedestrian problems map um, you can see a picture of there was very very uh, well received by people across the Greater Dublin area, um, mostly in the city centre, obviously, but we've seen people enthused with this very simple and easy way to um, report things that they have noticed in their local local areas. And we know from um, from our contacts within Dublin City Council is that they use this map as a resource um, to fix issues in the city. And they're very grateful that someone has done something that's been so widely used. Our general election manifesto was a 20 page document that we produced to give our hopefully hope, hopeful um, representatives an idea of the kind of grand thinking and big action that we need to take in Dublin and in the greater Dublin area, but also across the country um, to really um, put sustainable transport um, at the forefront of everything that we do when it comes to transport. So we were very, very happy with how well that was received and some of the, some of the comments we got from people in, um, people in the field from, of sustainable transport from all over the world. Um, so very grateful for that and the document is actually quite um, useful for us uh, in keeping, keeping ourselves um, enthused. Streets are for People uh, was a, um, a coalition of um, us, Dublin Cycling Campaign, the Irish Pedestrian Network, um, to enact people-based actions to take back streets for people for um, for um, temporary times. Um, so we've done. We were involved in the action on Lower Lower Liffey Street and South William Street, and both of those streets now are due to receive significant uh, car based reductions. So whereas they still might be accessible in some way or another to cars, the um, accessibility for pedestrians, especially vulnerable pedestrians, will be massively increased in both those streets. So we hope to do more actions like this um, in, with Streets Are For People, not necessarily always closing roads and you know annoying people, but any, any action we can do to encourage um, pedestrianized um, areas and encourage people being able to use their streets. That's something we're very happy to do. And the Bus Connects maps and extra info. We very proudly are, I am, designing um, maps for Bus Connects to help explain people what the new network is going to look like. This is not something that the NTA has asked me to do as a designer or anything like that. Um, I think we've left those rumors far behind us. Um, this is something that we are doing as a, as a public transport advocacy group to help inform um, public transport users about what is coming down the road. And I think that extra mile and that extra um, attention for um, these plans is kind of our wheelhouse. We take the information from the NTA or from the engineers and we distill it down into information, inf in, into language that um, everyone can understand. And I think that's really important that we do that. Um, we've also developed a very strong foundation on which to build. We have good lines of communication with the NTA. We're part of their um, um, press release mailing list now. So whenever something is re released, we get notified. So that's great. We were the first port of call for the media in a lot of cases um, regarding public transport issues. Um, my phone is constantly buzzing with people asking for comments on this and that. So it's very, very good that we have gotten to such a position. 
Um, we're regularly on the On The Move podcast at 98FM where we get a chance to really, really explain um, in detail all the things that we want Dublin to be about and um, the reasoning behind different decisions, um, which we don't always, which can't always be best conveyed by a text or a tweet. Speaking of which, our Twitter account is now 50% larger than it was last year. So we've increased from 3,000 followers to over 6,000 uh, in the past year. So that number is still growing quite fast. Um, so this is great to see everyone um, involved in that. But obviously, we want to widen our, our reach beyond just people who use Twitter. And we're also well known along, among local politicians um, who uh, know of us and come to, our, um, come to ask us questions. Um, whenever things um, don't really make sense to them, they want a better, a better viewpoint on things. So that's very good. Um, what we're seeing is a change landscape um, in the past year. We're seeing a lot more people demanding more um, from their sustainable transport options, especially under the, under the pandemic. Um, we've seen a massive explosion in cycling and it seems that everyone and their granny is asking for cycling lanes. And it's great to see people demanding this for themselves. Um, and they're more conscious of the power that they have and the, the voice they have, which is wonderful. Um, pedestrian issues are being placed at the forefront so much more than um, they used to be. So it's imperative for us as a public transport advocacy group to always think of pedestrians as the first port of call because no matter what you take, bus, Lewis or tram, bus, Lewis or train, um, you're a pedestrian when you step off that that vehicle. So it's so important for us that we always keep pedestrians at the, the, the forefront. And we're more aware of nimbious tactics. Now, I want to clarify that under no circumstances are we saying that anyone who disagrees or objects to something is a nimby or anything like that. All we're saying is that people are more aware of what people say to try and get things not put in their, in their, uh, in their area just because they don't want them. So it's very important that whenever someone says, I'm a resident, if you are a resident too, you speak up and you see the exact same thing. I'm a resident as well, and I want this. So that's what we're, what we're seeing now um, in, in, in the avenue of um, sustainable transport, which is fantastic. And this is our list of submissions that we've made, which are nearly the bread and butter of what we do a lot of the time. We're making submissions to government all the time. So the Bus Connects cord, Bus Corridors, massive, massive submission is going to be 16 documents um, submitted to, um, in October when that reopens. Um, the Bus Next Network redesign, we submitted our, con um, our submission on that back in, um, God, time doesn't mean anything anymore. It was a long time ago. Um, electric scooters, um, we more generally um, were invited to um, submit on um, climate change, active, smarter travel, of our own bat, we decided to submit a submission on Connolly Station, Amian Street entrance, calling for it not to be um, changed and turned into offices, but kept as a pedestrian, as a, a train entrance. And we're working on the moment uh, on Lewis Finglas and Dart Plus West. So what we would like to leave from this is for you to be reminded the importance of your submissions as well. It's not all about us and the documents and documents of submissions, you dropping an email to whoever it might be is asking for these submissions saying, I like this plan, is more than enough. You have to remember how important it is for you to, for your, for your power and the, the power that you have to just, even just say, yeah, I'm happy. I like this because that will affect um, the outcome of the plans. So um, yeah, I'm going to finish up and I'm going to hand back to Oshin. Thanks very much. I was on mute there. Um, so we had a, um, a few comments in the chat there. Um, Sean Barry wanted to highlight, uh, just as Kevin said, the value in sending in uh, uh, things to a consultation that Dublin City Council is having at the moment and also linked to a petition uh, on Uplift. Uh, we had uh, one question. If there's any other questions, feel free to send them in now. Um, that was uh, from Brendan. He was asking about the Bus Connects maps that you designed, Kevin. Um, could you uh, let us know where they can be found or if they're available yet? They aren't available yet because 
it's incredibly complex and it takes an obscene amount of time and um my work has been very very difficult so uh, over over the pandemic um i've been stretched um between where i normally work plus um other clients um to to pick up the slack basically so i don't actually have as much time as i did have at the start of pandemic whenever i started doing them so they're not ready yet but when they when they are ready you will know exactly where to find them because i will be sharing them every which way and um, we just got another question in there from peter brannigan asking uh, do we know when consultation will be open for dart coast south i think that hasn't been announced unless uh you know anything, Kevin? Uh, Felgen will be talking a little bit about the Dart Plus plans. I know the, the I, know, I don't know when, but I know the order. So Dart Plus West is first, and then the Kildare line, and then it'll be the Northern line, and then the Southern line. So the Southern line will be last, likely sometime next year, probably. Thanks very much. And um, just got a, a final question in there from Alan Downey asking if there's been any update on the e-scooter laws under the new government no unfortunately not we haven't heard anything back okay um thanks very much for that kevin um we're going to go over to felgen now who's going to talk a bit more about the various uh transport infrastructure plans that are coming down the pipeline Right, I hope everyone can see that. Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of the infrastructure projects that are, well, they're the ones that are in the media or in, in consultation right now, and the ones that are kind of in the background and the importance that we kind of need to stay on top of. So we'll talk about Lewis Fingler's Dark Plus, Dark Plus West, but more in general, because we got more details about that last month. What's next? Uh, all aspects of it, Metrolink, walking and cycling. Just, just a few things. Um, so Lewis Finglas, uh, that's the stats or the key figures from their website, four kilometers, which isn't that much. It's a very short extension when, in the grand scheme of the 40 odd kilometer network. It's four stops, 600 parking ride spaces. It would provide uh, people at Charlestown a route, a, way of getting to Trinity College in 30 minutes, which would be comparable to the bus service right now, but it would be a lot more predictable and it would take a lot more cars, uh, 10,000 cars off the road by 2035 actually, and it would take a lot more buses out of the Doyle's Corner, Hart's Corner area, which is something they've been really targeting with Metrolink and Lewis Finglas. Um, the frequency is not that high, it's one tram every 7.5 minutes, which is uh, it's quite low for Lewis really but it, it, I presume the section south of Bra Broombridge would have a higher frequency but we can we can talk about that further down the line I suppose. Um, they say there are 30,000 people living within one kilometre of, st of the stops but uh, this will rise to 50,000 with future development around the Jamestown area and Dublin Industrial Estate so they're really targeting this for future development and anyone who's already living there. So this is the projected loading figures. So you can see that there's a lot of unused capacity just kind of north of uh, Parnell Street, that area, that, that's what they're trying to utilize. So it, it's really a natural continuation of uh, Lewis Cross City. And that's just a few pictures from it. There will be adding a parallel walking and cycling route for much of the route, not all of it, but most of it. Um, most of the tracks will be will be grass tracks. So between the rails, you'll have grass instead of concrete. This would blend in with the route, which is mostly through parks and residential areas. So this is a big selling point for them. And it would also reduce the noise pollution coming from the Lewis. So grass, it absorbs a lot more noise and it's supposed to be um, blending in with the environment a lot more. That's just one of the bridges they have at Broombridge. They want to they want to make sure the bridge over at Broombridge is an 
is a very good uh, architecturally beautiful bridge that they'll put it out to a public competition. So the the old historical bridge is not obscured in any way, shape or form. And so yeah, it's just one of the figures they gave at a presentation recently. One of the few things that we are concerned about is the fact that it terminates at Charlestown and not say Northwood where it would connect with Metrolink. It seems like it's a missed opportunity because it's it's so close and it would then leave a lot, a lot of people in Finglas to go south into the city centre, then to catch Metrolink to go into Swords for the airport when it could have been connected up um, at Northwood, which the track could have been used for Metro West or something in the future. It didn't have to be just for Lewis. Um, another thing was the walking and cycling infrastructure provided. Well, it, it's clear that it was a, a late addition to the project and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, that well thought through, but we know that they know that, so that's good. They know they will improve it and they've said they will. It's not, this isn't, this is the first draft in terms of the walking and cycling routes at least. So they said they'll look into segregating the two much better. They said they'll look into maybe putting one on one side of the track and one on the other side of the track. So yeah, uh, they, they're looking into that. It's something that we're bringing up. But other than that, it's the, most of the complaints seem to be in two areas, one or uh, two residential areas where they may lose a few back gardens and a one cul-de-sac, which is now being, which will now have a tram going through it. So it, it's very localized. It, like, so it's mostly been received very well, extremely well. And there are a few concerns with the parks and how the safety and that would work, but they've um, guaranteed that the trams would be going relatively slowly in the park areas and it would integrate very well with the park and they won't be putting up fences or anything. They'll be using trees and hedges and all that sort of um, uh, anything like that to segregate the track from the, the park. So that's Lewis Fingers. Uh, make sure to make submission on that. That closes next week. So even even like Kevin said, just put in something that says, I like this. That will do. So uh, you don't have to disagree with something to make a submission. Just make a submission. I'll be saying that a lot. Um, the only problem with the Lewis Fingers is that in the National Development Plan, it's only funded for design and planning only. It's not funded for construction. So that the National Development Plan will be reviewed later this year. So what we want is for them to is for them to bring forward the construction phase from after 2027 to preferably immediately after planning, which would be 2024. So there's a, about a three, three, four year gap where they'll be doing nothing, which is completely unnecessary. Uh, so get onto your TDs, tell them to ask for uh, the Minister of Finance or Minister of Public Expenditure to bring forward the funding as soon as possible. Dart Plus, so it's basically Dart Underground minus the Underground. Uh, they've, they've basically looked at the entire Dart Underground plan and they said, well, if all the sections without the tunnel still have a very good um, cost to benefit ratio, they said, well, you need the tunnel to fully realize the entire potential of the network, but if we still do all of this, it'll cost half as much and it'll improve the network immensely. So they're going ahead with that and they're utilizing the Phoenix Park Tunnel a lot more, which wasn't in the original Dodge Underground. So it would involve frequent uh, electric, electrified services from Dublin City Centre uh, to Dublin City Centre from Maynooth and M3 Parkway from Hazel Hatch, from Drada and Greystones. So that's just a map of the network. You can find that online. Again, this is open for consultation. Please, please make a submission. So someone asked about the Dart South there. Yeah, that's the last one on the on the list. So that's the Dart Plus West. That's the one that's being in consultation now. They're aiming to these consultations will be there'll be a lot of these. There'll be there'll be a lot of these coming in the next couple of months. Maynooth, 
is open now and they say there'll be a second consultation in November or December. So that's how quickly these will be, these will be uh, announced. That's just Minute again. Then there will be Kildare next year, then the Northern Line, the Southern Line, Dark Post West, they're aiming to have completed by the end of 2024. So that's probably the first of the big ticket projects uh, that'll be completed. So it's, I know every time someone asks us when something will be completed, we say 2027. That's when everything will be completed. The Metro, the bus connects, all of, all of Dark Post eventually should be completed by 2027, but this section will be completed by 2024. It'll be done in phases. So uh, again, this is available online. Please make a submission. Um, in terms of Dark Plus West, uh, basically they're closing all the level crossings. They're replacing a lot of them with bridges and pedestrian bridges. So one, they're not replacing at all. Two, they're replacing with just pedestrian crossings and cycling um, bridges. One with an underpass. Most of the opposition to this seems to be just um, the rerouting of traffic through the underpass into a different area that it's not popular in um, some areas, Ashtown, I think. And other than that, uh, people are saying that it should go to Kilcock, not Minuth, because the depot is actually out beyond Minuth, almost in Kilcock. That's where all of the, it'll be electrified all the way out to there, but they're not serving it. So a lot of people are not happy about that. Other than that, um, again, walking and cycling, uh, looking at the very, very rough uh, uh, pictures they've given us, it, but I mean, we're not quite sure how it's supposed to work, um, uh, how buses and cars and cyclists and pedestrians are segregated in the underpass and a, lot, a few of the bridges. That's another concern we have. Other than that, uh, there seems to be just confusion over some of the parts of the project. There's a part called the New Common Cord, which is being removed, but we, then they say they're not removing it. So other than that, it, again, it's been received very well. People in Minute and people in, uh, well, I want to say Navin, but the Navin Road uh, M3 Parkway have been waiting for this for decades. So please, please make a consultation uh, submission. Other than that, um, walking and cycling. So they've been making a lot of these uh, bus stop extensions and footpath extensions. They recently got funding for about one kilometer of these in length of these extensions. So that's, that's a lot of uh, extended footpaths around Dublin. Uh, it's basically just these uh, kind of some sort of plastic curb that they're putting in and then filling in with tarmac. So they're going to do about a, a kilometer worth of these uh, plastic curbs. They're adding uh, a few pedestrian crossings here and there. Uh, Griff, no, sorry, uh, Mountjoy Squares is the big one, which has been sorely lacking pedestrian crossings for a long time. They've decreased the pedestrian crossing waiting times. I should say waiting times, not crossing times. They decreased the waiting times so that you uh, you get a green light to cross sooner than before, but that means there's less capacity for cars. There's been a lot of um, backlash over that but they've stuck with that in a lot of places. Uh, I think they've tweaked it in a few places but that's uh, one positive. Dressing our streets, I'm sure you've all seen um, or heard about Grafton Street area, the St. William Street, Drury Street um, area being pedestrianized for six weekends in July and August. Um, that trial is now over they're going to write up a report and uh, come back with, I suppose they're going to come back with a few options about what to do. Uh, I think they were taking submissions and 92% said it should be made permanent uh, through the consultation. Again, that's the power of consultations. Uh, so the, it was extremely well received. Even the businesses were uh, by a large majority in favor of it. Uh, their places in their business in on South Ham Street were like calling for more. They were they were asked for uh, footpath extensions like this so they can put out um, chairs and tables for their customers. They got that done in like two three weeks. So a business have been really leading some of the pedestrianised streets and pedestrian areas. Um, they've been leading that charge for a few weeks now. So that's 
positive. Cycling, um, so <laughs> it's in Dunleary right then, for starters, they've been doing extremely well. Uh, a mix of local, very good local advocates and good leadership, a new good leadership at the council. Uh, I'm not saying we don't need to, you know, like, we don't need to <laughs> stay on top of what they're doing or like let them add it, but like what they, all the new stuff they've been coming up with seems to be extremely, extremely good. Yeah, there are a few tweaks here and there, nothing's perfect, but still. Dublin City Council uh, published this COVID-19 interim mobility strategy. It promised basically uh, interventions for cycling um, along all these corridors here. Unfortunately, in terms of delivering it, it's all been a bit um, piecemeal and it's, it's almost entirely bollards like this, which sadly can be parked on. Uh, that's the one big negative and the other one, it's not, it, in a lot of places, they're literally just uh, putting down these bollards where the cycle lanes were. Even when there's space to widen the cycle lane, they just, they're just putting them down and moving on to the next location. So it could be a lot, lot better uh, for these um, radial routes that they're putting in the interventions. Uh, having said that, there is a consultation for a fairly big project. It's the Strand Road cycle route. It would go from around Shonmore Park down to the Marion Gates. So that's about four kilometers, I think. It's a, it would be fantastic for, basically, uh, it'd be a fantastic resource for our commuters. It'd be fantastic for uh, families to just cycle along the coast. It'd be very similar to the Dunleary Rattan Coastal Mobility Route. In fact, if this goes ahead, they, they would work with Dublin Dublin Rathdown County Council, sorry, Dunleary Dun Rathdown County Council to join up with the coastal mobility route. So if you go to consultation.dubncity.ie or if someone could post the actual link, I think someone did a few minutes ago, uh, and make a submission because there's a lot of resistance to this. Um, it would be amazing if you just make a submission for that saying, I like this, but just that's all you need. Also, the COVID-19 mobility measure request form, if you, Again, if I gave you the full link, you couldn't, uh, you wouldn't remember it, but if you just Google that or someone could put a link to that, um, you can request footpath extensions, cycle lanes, cycle parking, bus stops, well, bus stop extensions, anything that you found annoying when walking around Dublin City, uh, you can put it into this form and they'll look into it. They've acted on quite a few of them at the start, then they kind of and started doing a few different things. Recently, they said they'll go back to this and um, look into it again. So if you can put some local issue that you have into this form and get a few other people to look into it and put it into this form, they might actually fix this. So take the opportunity now and just fill out the form. Um, what's next? Uh, it's been a bit quiet for a couple of months since the last consultation was well, it started and then none of the consultation events went ahead because of the pandemic. So they'll have a, a third consultation in October. The unwanted third sequel of a uh, corpus corridors will be, I think it will be October and November, October and November. They will have made a lot of changes on the last version, the version that was published in March. So particularly with junctions and stuff. So do keep an eye out for that. The network redesign, we know that they've completed the new network. They've, they've decided on what, what's, what, what it's gonna look like, but we don't know what it looks like. But we know they've decided and they have com they're coming up with an implementation strategy now, or they may have already finished that. It'll start in 2021 and will go on till 2023 was the last we heard. We don't know if they changed that. The 90 minute fair, again, will be implemented in 2021, was the last we heard. Uh, we want them to do it as soon as possible, but at the minimum, it should be implemented before the network is changed. Uh, camera enforcement. This is something that we've been pushing for very, very heavily over the past couple of months. 
a lot of parliamentary questions, a lot of freedom of information requests. Um, so as it stands, the last we heard, the minister is yet to make a decision. But having said that, recently we were denied a few documents when we asked for them because it's part of the um, part of the decision making process. We were never denied anything before, which means well they are actually looking into this now so uh the whole saga started in 2018 april 2018 uh, when the nta first asked for it it is now two years and however months and they they're getting around to it now if you want to read more about that there's a blog on our website but we're, pu we're pushing quite heavily for this and it's something that we want to get done as soon as possible there is a lot of momentum for this now so if you if you would like to help out, just email the minister and say, I want you to bring in camera enforcement. Metrolink. Uh, it's been very quiet for the last year since the preferred route was published. There, since then, there was a little mini consultation for uh, the Albert College Park area. But we've been told that they will go to Envoplanola in early 2021. They said the design was delayed due, uh, due to design complexity. Uh, and they pointed out stations like mm -hmm. Class 11, Tara Street, uh, St. Stephen's Green. But they are going to ten, uh, send out the tenders and all of that while it's in the planning process, while it's in the plan on it. So hopefully they can hit the ground running when they do get permission uh, instead of waiting another a year or two to uh, go through procurement and stuff. And because of the Green Line uh, metro upgrade not going ahead anymore. It might be a little bit more easier. There might be less, uh, the design might be a little less complex there. So we're hoping that it's still on track for a 2027 opening. They haven't said it's been delayed. They, I know they said it, the Bopanala stage has been delayed, but they haven't said the opening has been delayed so far. We're hoping they can make a few uh, time savings there. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> Just a few things. <laughs> So I think if you have any questions, actually, I'll put that up. Yeah, thanks a million, uh, Felgen. Uh, we got uh, loads of questions in. Uh, what do you oh, speak? God, 25 questions. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first one was um, just regarding, you talked a lot about uh, making submissions, mm -hmm. uh, consultations. Uh, so we had one question, which was just simply, uh, when you talk about making a submission, how is this usually done? Does it mean uh, you'd have to get in touch with your local TDs or other other activities that you need to do to make your opinion heard? Uh, generally, when we're talking about submissions like to projects like Lewis Finglas or Dark Plus or Buzz Connects, it's, it's literally just a case of going onto their website. They'll have a form these days and just uh, submit your thoughts and your name and your emails, just saying I like this, but I or I like this, but. I think this could be better or something like that. It should be that simple. Now, we'd encourage everyone to be as detailed as possible and uh, as thorough as possible, but even just saying, I like this is much better than not saying anything. <laughs> but for a lot of things, uh, getting in touch with your local cancer is actually very good. Uh, now, like the Grange Gorman filter permeability uh, that was uh, on Grange Gorman Road, they, wanted to filter the road so that it only lets cyclists and pedestrians through but still allows car traffic up to the bol bol bollards for local access. But, I mean there is no consultation, not really. You can email them to the council and tell them you like it but the councillors were getting a lot of feedback from their own constituents. In cases like that it's very important that you also email them and tell them that you like, the, that you like this new measure and you want them to hold on or keep it or try it for a little bit longer or uh, cycle lanes uh, especially they're like the especially the ones with the bollards and stuff um there's not you there's usually no consultation for a lot of these things the bigger projects definitely but for the smaller projects there's usually no consultation and it still results in a lot of um a lot of opposition from people saying it's delaying traffic or uh, something all sorts. Um, in a lot of cases like that, if you see a new cycle lane uh, outside your house, email your councillors and be like, hey, this is great. I want more of this. Or if you have an idea for 
a new uh, cycle lane or new widened footpath or something like that, just email your candidate and be like, I, I have this idea. I think it'd be fantastic if you, um, if you call for this. What I would suggest actually, if you are submitting a, a submission uh, on Lewis Finglas or any of the things happening with Dublin City Council and you're submitting it to the NTA or Dublin City, um, tag your councillors in the email. Just write the one email and send it to all of them. You mightn't necessarily respect, uh, expect a, a reply from your councillors, but if they know that there's a sizable amount of people who agree with any of these proposals, they'll have a better idea of like the actual public opinion because we know from experience that people only can only ever contact their councillors when they want to complain about something. So they need to start hearing more whenever people are happy with stuff. Uh, so another question was, uh, you talked a lot of, there's a lot of consultations you mentioned. Uh, so a few people asked if there's, a, if we have a list of upcoming consultations or if not, if we'd be able to create one or put it on, we tag it on, uh, uh, what's the word, pin it on Twitter or something? Yeah, that's something we should definitely do. I think I will do that this evening. I'll pin a tweet to uh, the top of thing. I'll also put a page on the website and say all open, have a section for all open um, consultations on the very many things that are happening right across the city. So yeah, that's a great idea and we'll definitely implement that. Um, so uh, there was a few questions about um, kind of whatever happened to questions. Uh, so uh, whatever happened to Metro West? Uh, Metro West. Um, Metro West never went to Embarcado Plan Island stage as far as I know. It didn't get planning permission. It was, they did up the route, they came to an emerging preferred, they came to a preferred route. Uh, that was around 2009, 2010, I think, and then it was immediately shelved. I don't think it went to a uh, planning stage, or, but I could be wrong on that. But uh, for the foreseeable future, it's not on the cards. Uh, we've been calling for it, but it's not on the cards. It's not in the graded open area transport strategy 2016, 2035, which means it won't be built in that period. It's not in the National Development Plan either. So for the foreseeable future, it's not happening. Having said that, there's a review of that coming up, so we'd be asking for that to be included. When the Metro West was part of the, the transport strategy for the region, there was, no, there was no bus connects and there was no orbital bus corridors as part of bus connects. So there was no orbital movement possible in the city. But since there's now going to be three orbital bus corridors built as part of bus connects, um, which, by the way, will be starting consultation uh, right as soon as the radial corridors are finished, so we have more consultations to look forward to. Um, there was no orbital movements possible. So um, once those were brought in uh, as part of Bus Connects, the, the, the necessity for Metro West went down. It was pretty much what happened. And considering now that Metro Link is going to be completely autonomous and completely segregated from traffic, um, Metro West won't be able, wouldn't be able to interact with uh, Metrolink as originally designed because Metro West was going to go on road and intermingle with traffic much like the Lewis. So Metro West will require um, a complete rethink basically. Um, so related to other maybe semi-shelled uh, projects, um, Brendan asks, is there any point in agitating for Dart Underground anymore? It appears to be mothballed. Um, and the same, he asks the same question in relation with, to the Navin line. Um, I suppose one thing to consider with, with, with any additional projects now is that even if we had more or less infinite money, the NTA slash TII are basically so busy now that they, it's just a matter of where, where these projects would even be fitted in in terms of somebody having a look at the planning I would, of any of these projects, it just we just don't have the resources in terms of uh, bodies rather than money. Yeah. Um, Dart Underground is um, included part as part of the, the transport strategy as far as 2035. And the strategy, um, if you look into it, shows Dart Underground being complete by 2035. Now, how likely that is, is meant to be seen. But under that strategy, the NTA is required to progress all the transport plans under the assumption that Dart Underground will be built. So 
that's what it is so far. It hasn't been shelved like Metro West. It's still part of the strategy and still planned. And in relation to the Navin line, can you say anything about that? Nothing, unfortunately, no. Um, it's something we are considering um, advocating for, but it's something that obviously, just like Simon said, we're a bit stretched. Um, so it's something that we'll need to look into a lot more. And it's something that we wanted to do before the pandemic is to get into local areas, especially in Meath and um, in Fingal and, and these areas, because um, we're very, very Dublin city based at the moment. We wanted to get into these areas and start talking to local people about what they want and need from their public transport. But um, it's just not something we've been able to get to. And unfortunately, it's not planned. Um, it's not on any plan, unfortunately. Um, and also just to say, the voice that you heard earlier was uh, Simon, who's one of our ordinary committee members, so I didn't introduce him earlier. Um, uh, another question was, um, with the plans to increase the frequency of the darts to and from Greystones, um, what is the implication of that for direct services from Kilcool, Rotrum, Arklow, Wexford into the city centre? Um, Oshin, I suppose, to, uh, just because I was reading the questions as they came along, maybe a dozen sort of dart plus uh, related questions and um, this is an area that where we have been looking to to uh Irish rail to be more transparent we the, you know we we're not that we were kind of caught by surprise we knew dart plus was always coming but then the fact that it just gets announced we kind of got hints of dart plus in thingless the thingless um uh, lewis update the 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 details of, of the DART project are scarce and there is potentially the case that we maybe the next public meeting we might focus more on the DART because there is a, a depth of knowledge there. People aren't really clear as to what the what is happening with the DART, what what the implication is on the intercity um intercity units and what's the case, you know, with Spencer Dock has been mentioned uh, and a few, a few other questions are, you know, the, the, the apparent spur to the airport has, has come up as well. And um, so th there may be potential that we might look at that as a, as a topic in of itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I suppose um, there is a lot of questions. So perhaps we should say that, yeah, especially in relation to Barrett Plus, which is being planned in a slightly different way to other transport plans that's being done in-house by Transport Infrastructure Ireland, we don't have as much information as we would about other plans. So um, I think if uh, Felgen and Kevin, if you want to just kind of say, we don't really know, um, yeah, I think it's, that's a response as well. The, 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 the real issue with DART uh, Plus is it's hard to know what the service pattern is going to be. Uh, we know there'll be a change. Um, it looks like there might be a shuttle from Hoth to Hoth Junction. So it might not be possible to get the dart from Hoth all the way into town anymore. Um, it might be uh, a situation where um, intercity chain trains from Rosslair stop at Greystones and you swap to a dart. These are all like possible things that we're looking at the plans and seeing, are they going to do that? Like, we don't know. That's, that's the thing. And it's very difficult to guess and give a better idea of um, how frequent these trains are going to be on different parts of the network um, because the service pattern isn't clarified. We don't know if trains are coming from Maynooth are going to stop in Greystones. We don't know if trains coming from Maynooth are going to stop in Connolly or, or what it is. And all of that affects that. So it's a very complex thing um, that we don't know. And we are, I would say, is not actually clarified yet within um, Irish Rail either. So um, for the moment, watch this space. Basically, uh, so I'll, I'll try. I'll just to uh, ensure that everyone's question is answered. I'll, I'll try to just just ask ask them nevertheless. Yeah. Um, so one is one question is is the north south trail vo train volumes through Connolly still an issue? And um, I understand that, that that the main issue there is really with the bridge rather than the Connolly station. But if one wants to take that, uh, Connolly is going to be reconfigured, um, and Spencer Dock is basically going to be a backup Connolly. So a lot more trains that would end in Connolly, will now end in Spencer Dock. Um, it looks like trains coming from Drogheda won't go through the city, they'll go either terminate at Connolly or terminate at Spencer Dock, so that will free up space on the Leap Line Bridge. Um, all these things will be mixed around and messed with, and that's um, 
what is being considered at the moment. So um, also you have to consider whenever uh, darts are going out to Drogheda or Drogheda, um, there'll be less need for commuter services out to Drogheda. So those trains will come off the network. So it won't be necessarily the same amount of um, um, service from all the different um, train types. Um, so that partially answers the question, another question about uh, just whether that line to Drogheda is too busy and how, whether yeah. we'll be able to take the, the extra trains necessary to have to have the dart going out to uh, Drogheda. Um, uh, as a similar question was just in relation to one of the slides. Um, uh, Kieran asked, what does design team contract award mean and what does railway order lodged mean? Uh, that is one of my slides, I think. Yep. Uh, railway order lodged is railway order is basically planning permission for trains, trans, Lewis, Metro. Uh, so that basically it's going to Embark uh, What was the design team award? So that's um, so Irish Rail are giving out these contracts to companies like Jacobs and uh, all these kind of design team. I think um, not quite sure who's working on this right now. Um, who would be in charge of designing uh, either one of these lines or all of these lines. <coughs> I think they have a contract out for one uh, consultant to do all the lines and they're contracting out to other companies to do the individual ones. Uh, it's basically just uh, that's when design starts. So uh, many of it started last year. Uh, Kildare started quite recently, very recently. And the northern, northern and southern lines haven't, or maybe they've started now. What was the third one? A uh, contract award? No, it was just two. Um, and, oh, yeah, sorry, the, yeah, the, the other one was, was design team contract award. Yeah, that, that was that one, yeah. Um, so, I need two questions about Spencer Dock. Um, one is um, if Dark Plus is considering using a new station at Spencer Dock to interchange with the Lewis, would it be feasible then to create a link to the airport as it could use the North Wall Spur and interchange with Northern Rail Services at Clon Griffin? Another question uh, was Is Spencer Dock station for Dark Plus a waste of money to beef up the Red Lewis when you have the Dockland station? Uh, that cost 30 million so far, including the bus park, which opened last year. Yeah, uh, Dockland Station was um, designed to be temporary. Um, it was never supposed to be uh, a, um, a station for as long as it has been a station. It was supposed to be replaced by Dart Underground. It was, it was always designed to be replaced by Dart Underground. And the Dart Underground Station for Spencer Dock was going to be where they now envisage the, um, the Overground Station being beside the, the Lewis at Spencer Dock. Um, as I said, Spencer Dock is being designed as not just to serve the area and to, to supplement the Lewis, because um, you know that section of the North Keys isn't fully developed as much as the South Keys. So we're going to have a lot more people living there, a lot more people working there, especially um, with your man wanting to build skyscrapers in that area and stuff. There's going to be a lot more people um, that need public transport in that area. So um, Spencer Dock is being designed to complement Connolly. Um, because we can't um, just have one central station on one side of the city and Houston on the other. Um, it does need a backup. So that's what Spencer Dock is for. And we would probably, notwithstanding the placement and how the placement of the station might affect the delivery of Dark Underground and the rest of it, um, it is something that we would probably advocate for as well. Um, Mike Bannum asks regarding the bus Sorry. stop. Sorry, just on the on the spur to the airport. Ultimately, uh, to keep it as short as possible, the, the cost benefit, if there's a cost benefit assessment, um, MetroLink is going to provide that link and and deliver far more service than a, a spur across Greenfield sites, which will negatively impact the service patterns on, on the Northern Line. Yeah, I'd, I'd um, also add that. I mean, one thing that I think we 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 we've talked about is the you know, how useful it would be to extend the, uh, ensure that the Metro North links up with the Dart, probably further north up. Uh, yeah, yeah, Donbridge. 
in Donabay is probably the best option for um, giving people in North Dublin access to the airport and creating a, a link, uh, or creating a network of um, transport so that people can live in Balbriggan and travel to Sword for work and not necessarily always have to go into Dublin City. Um, okay, so Mike Bannon asks, uh, regarding the bus stop build-outs, is there anything we can do to get A, more of them, and B, get them designed as an island, i.e. with a cycling bypass? Um, cycling bypasses now will constitute a change in the road, and I think that requires planning permission. So you can make the footpath bigger, but you can't have a separate... Like That's my understanding of it, and that's why a lot of things like the... The contraflow on Nassau Street uh, ends quite abruptly and you have to go around a corner. Yeah, that's pretty much why um, we haven't been doing that. Uh, it's because it requires planning permission. Um, so then we have uh, two questions about uh, kind of the plans that are coming down, um, in particular in relation to these uh, bike lanes and footpaths and so on. Uh, Alan Downia asks, have Dublin City Council published a list of corridors for cycling? There doesn't seem to be any clear plan and ballards appear inconsistently and at random it seems. And Connor asks, do you guys have any transparency on what sustainable transport initiatives relating to planes, footpaths, etc. are in the pipeline? Or do you just see them as we do when they appear? A lot of the implementation seems random. For Dublin City Council, they, they published that document back in June called uh, COVID-19 interim mobility plan, I think. This um, COVID-19 interim mobility strategy enabling the city to return to work, it's not a very catchy name. Um, that had uh, all the corridors highlighted and um, they, they kind of labeled a lot of the areas that they'll make interventions in. That was mostly in the core city center area, but outside the very inner core city centre area. So it was basically like Phippsburg Road, uh, Ratlines Road, and a few of those. Other than that, there, there hasn't really been any uh, map or anything like that. And they've made, they've made uh, changes outside of this. They've done like Griffith Avenue, which wasn't in the document. They've done Strand Road, which wasn't in the document as far as I know, and a few other things like that. So. No, there's nowhere that you can go to to just see what's what they'll be doing over the next year. Uh, fortunately, but this will be a good this will be a good uh, starting point. Uh, what was the second one? Do we find out before? Um, yeah. Yes and no. Um, so they've started doing something in that they've started emailing councillors every week with um, a weekly update on traffic measures like cycle lanes and footpaths and all these sort of things that they've been doing or they plan on doing and some councillors have been very generous to send that on to us uh, so we get that before basically anyone else finds out and um, other than that not really no. um, I think you uh, so uh... Alan Downey uh, encourages everyone, as we did as well, I think, uh, to make a submission uh, to Strand Road um, and also encourages people to suggest that it be connected to Kitchen House. Uh, he also asks who is designing these cycle lanes? Is it the council or the NTA? Or, um... uh, both, I think. Um, in Dublin, it's uh, the NTA. Uh, are very much more hands-on than say, well, especially in Dublin City Council, than say Fingal or um, even Mead. Now, Dublin, and the NTA have more powers in the Greater Dublin area than they do outside of the Greater Dublin area, but even still, they're very much more hands-on in Dublin City. Uh, they seem, they pretty much sign off on every single project. Like this document was, uh, it's, it was a joint NTA, Dublin City Council document. They spent quite a lot of time on it, both of them. So. It, it's it's a mixture of both. Now the think the Dublin sorry the NTA cycle design office. I'm not quite sure how involved they are in the temporary measures. I don't think they are. I think they're more still focusing on long term measures. I'm not quite sure, but the answer is both really. Mm. The NTA signed off on the the, the mobility strategy, <clears throat> and they're funding this the uh, the temporary um, temporary yeah. lanes and things like that. But um, obviously they 
<clears throat> see this as temporary solution and this is not how your cycle network is going to look forever. It's just something to get it quick and fast. Rain asks, on Dart Plus, will there be any extra tracks laid, uh, even for passing loops? Uh, surely with all the extra projects, intercity traffic will be effective. Yeah, there will be, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a, a nice, nice short answer. Uh, Adam, yeah, Kane, <laughs> Adam Kane asks, has there been any news on the leap card for the iPhone app? Uh, uh, it's been the coming months for 10 months now. Um, so soon, I don't know. I know uh, one thing is that the um, the 90 minute fair is being done as part of the next generation ticketing. So moving the leap card information from the card itself to the cloud. So the 90 minute fair is going to happen as part of that. So that's happening hopefully sometime whenever the network starts in 2021. So basically the entire experience of using LeapCard will change next year. But hopefully that app comes out sooner rather than later. Hopefully it's just been delayed due to COVID. But um, yeah. And David asked a question in relation to one of the slides. You had a quote up, uh, it was in relation to enforcement. I think you had a quote up from- one Yes, of the I did. Asking the minister and that, yeah. was, that quote was from. That was from an email from a civil servant to us basically saying uh, I, there's no point in giving you these documents because the minister has yet to make a decision and that's what all our um, replies to these emails are going to say the minister has yet to make a decision so all of these though do refer to the minister for transport yeah just uh, to clarify yeah in that, that was the question um, uh, Robert uh, asked a question about volunteers getting involved with um, the coalition that's what the next item on the agenda is going to be so i'll leave that until then um tom asks um has there been any discussions about whether or not peak time commuting demand has fundamentally changed there are discussions in media about the shift from work to home but it's all speculation um i think uh, just by looking at the state of the city uh currently you can see that not everyone's gone back to work um, a lot of people are still working from home, but we still have quite serious congestion in a lot of places. Um, and we still don't have um, great ways of getting around the city. It's still difficult, difficult to get from, say, Finglas to Tala. Um, so whether we need to make these journeys for commuting or whether we need to make these journeys to enjoy the city that we live in, I still think it's very important that we um encourage sustainable transport um projects even because i think dublin um whenever all of this is complete will still be below standard when it comes to other european cities um so i think even getting us up to standard and then the resulting drop due to um uh people working from home will put us in a very good position so i think we should keep pushing for what we are, are what we are currently working on yeah the commuting patterns may have and will change but um the need to travel hasn't and you can see that in the um weekly or the daily dublin bus passenger figures it's recovery in the weekday figures are like 40 50 percent but the weekend figures are much higher they're they're growing at like 60 65 percent so there's still there are people or more people want want to get out over the weekend and when you look at the cycling numbers uh peak time cycling is, is still at like 35, 40% in at the counters that they're counting at. But overall during the day, it's at the same level as 2019 or even higher. So more people are cycling off peak as opposed to at peak times, way more people. So the need to travel still hasn't changed. I suppose just to find one last point to add to that is that there, there, with all of these projects, there, there's always something, you know, that this is why we, we're still 40 years down the road waiting for, for Dark Plus, you know, there's always a, what a, this current thing that's happening now. Like, an awful lot of these projects are essentially infinity projects, you know, a Metro in Dublin is going to be there for basically, like, forever, more or less, um, yeah. you know, so there will, you know, it needs to be done, it needs to be started sometime, it's just a matter of when we actually just start 
Okay, I think we'll wrap up the questions um, on that section just because we new ones are coming in and we're answering them as they come in. So I think sure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to thing or else we'll be we'll be here all night. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we, we just really have kind of two more questions, so we can probably just yeah those and then move on. Um, so uh, one of them is in relation to um, the uh, again the direct rest. Uh, I think they came in when when you were uh, addressing that. Uh, so one was um, in, rela uh, um, in relation to oh sorry my mouse has slipped. Um, um, uh, the possibility of uh, new stations on the Dublin West Line. Uh, I, um, yeah, Fergus has asked again about the closing of the Dockland station, and there's a question about um, the uh, uh, what the difference is between the two direct coastal consultations. Okay. Yeah, so there's a new station opening on the Maynooth line uh, in Pelletstown. That'll be open before um, the Dart line, so that'll be a new Dart station. I don't think there's any more for the rest of the line. Obviously, there's scope to open stations as they're needed. There's a new station opening in Woodbrook on Dart Coastal, and I think that's it for a new station, apart from Glass and Evan. Um, and Kyle Moore. Kyle Moore, yes, sorry, there is isn't anyone with Kyle Moore. So it's by four or five new stations as part mm -hmm. of the Dart Plus. Um, the Dart Coastal, um, I think there's an I think there's just a typo on that um timeline that Felgen had up. One should be for Dart Coastal North and the other should be for Dart Coastal South. Um, but they both say north and south. So I think that's just an error there. Uh, I'm going to leave the kind of more open-ended question about the 15-minute city concept. Uh, That's very much a, a planning and housing and development thing and would be very much out of our wheelhouse. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, now uh, Simon and Janice, are, they are two ordinary members of our committee uh, and both have uh, joined, I think, within the last six or nine months. Uh, and they're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do and how you can get involved with the coalition. Um, yeah, over to you. So Sheen, um, yeah, so myself and Simon are just going to talk a little bit about why we joined and what made us get involved and then the types of stuff that we've been involved in over the past uh, year. I, I only joined in February and then COVID hit, so I really, I'm just finding my feet with this. Um, but I suppose I joined because I'm a Dubliner and love the city, but um, want to make it more livable. Um, I work in a health charity, so kind of involved in a national level, but want to get more kind of involved in grassroots on the ground. Um, so that's kind of my motivation for getting involved. I certainly have no expertise in planning or public transport and I'm learning a lot. Uh, Simon? Um, myself and Kevin kind of came across one another on Twitter, uh, kind of one man army correct, trying to fight the good fight about bus connects and the you know, how everyone's bus was going to be taken away and you'd have to walk everywhere, basically. Uh, and, and I just got involved um, fr from that point of view of, you know, you know just, just tired of, of the misinformation and just trying to get out there and try to help push these projects, get them over the line. There, there, there's, a, there's a vast, silent majority out there who want these projects there. And we just, you know, I just thought we could help um, achieve some, some, of the, some of these goals. So I suppose in terms of ways that people can get involved, it's it's as big or as small as you want to make it. Um, it's very this you know it's very flexible in, in, in that regard. So, um, you know examples would be the submissions that we've talked about, the consultations like feeding into drafts that we're working on or working on your own draft. But a lot of it as well is just local knowledge. So you know that we kind of mentioned earlier on about kind of having a lot of expertise around the city centre. So the more diversity we have in the membership, the the breadth of people across the Dublin region, the more informed we can be, and the more you know we can lobby. So you know we just really call for people to get on board. If you've got local knowledge for uh, there's a gap that we have, then you know please feel free to to share it. Yeah, uh, to just to, to echo that, uh, I mean it's more or less the same thing in terms of. Uh, local knowledge it, it, to a degree. I mean, when we talk about big ticket items like the Dart uh, West, we, we can kind of have a look at a map and try to figure things out. But when it comes to the, 
to the local knowledge of well, like, who need, what, what, where do we need a footpath, or what, where's where's a bicycle lane going to need, be needed in in Kildare or, or, or any of these high Greater Dublin County areas, um, or even within Dublin, I get our, our knowledge starts to, to kind of fall down on on the ground, and I mean, you, you can be as involved or or not, um, you know, just it just as you say, um. You can just help out with that or what I've been doing is because I'm from an IT background so I've been trying to help out with the you know the that Google Maps thing and the teams is what I do anyway in work so I'm helping helping out from that point of view uh, however stuff like website design and stuff is not my wheelhouse <laughs> you know, so there's th things like that that we we're, we're, there's certainly scope for somebody who, who Who's who's a website designer to kind of throw together a nice new website for us, and you know that that could just be the you, you come, you do it, and you, you you say thanks very much, and we say thanks very much, and that's greatly received, you know. Yeah, I suppose obviously things are more accessible now. Like we used, to, we were meeting physically, you know, in Dublin city centre, but obviously in the the world we're in now, you know, that's not an option, but it also is an opportunity as well that you know, in terms of people's own lives and that you can, you know, slot in for an hour and, you know, slot back out again. So, um, you know, and the more people we have, the more we can influence and that's ultimately, you know, what the coalition is about. Yeah. And I mean, you don't have to be, you know, a, a, a rail nerd or geek, whichever one, which, which is the one that's not insulting. Um, yeah, but you don't have to be somebody who's massively into trains or massively in, into a, uh, public consultation documents or anything like that as the, as you said you know local knowledge on the ground is, is more invaluable you can pick some of this stuff up out of google maps whereas we the stuff on, on we, like that we've gotten an awful lot when you talk to people going well this needs to be done or that needs to be done and that's you know what we're looking that's the that sort of stuff there that level of, of um input would be great I suppose obviously we're quite a new uh, group, uh, still kind of, you know, f finding your feet as well. So in terms of what was uh, Kevin spoke about earlier, the formal side of, I think, the back the back end in terms of the, the structures as well. So, you know, ideally we would like to be in a position to, um, you know, to take membership and to have the right kind of governance structures in place as well. So, you know, certainly would welcome support around kind of a treasurer role and, the, you know, the, the financial side of things. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose even at the end of the day, I know we've been talking about uh, consultations the entire time, but again, if you've, you know, if you have any feedback, as, a, as just like drop us an email with an idea like that suggestion there about the listing off all the consultations, you know, that was something that's a great idea, but it's just something that didn't occur to us. Um, so if you have any of those ideas, Felgen had the slide up there, we've several uh, modes of contact Facebook, Twitter, email, um, you know, just let us know. We will we'll definitely take them under advisement. Yeah, so I just want to just want to echo again <clears throat> what Janice meant that we are um, currently down uh, a treasurer. Um, we did um, elect one last year, but unfortunately he's had to he's had to leave the role. So if you are interested in getting involved with the committee, um, uh, for treasurer role, um, please get in contact and um, we'll need to give the the, co the constitution another another read through. Um, but we might be able to just co-opt you on, or we might need to take a vote. I just need to remind myself of that. Okay, um, I think so, we have any um, more questions. Um, yeah, there was uh, one came in uh, just uh, asking about how we relate with uh, other groups. Um, in similar groups in other cities and counties and I guess other groups that are active around um, questions of transport. Yeah, so from, um, as a result of um, the work we've been doing, um, we have begun, uh, sorry, a group has begun in Cork. So Cork Community Coalition uh, was born um, a couple of months ago. And obviously, COVID stopped them being able to get involved, um, get 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 running, um, get up and running uh, as much as they would like. And we'd like to uh, offer them as much support as we co can. Um, ideally, we'd love to have, create a network of these groups uh, around the country because we just look after the Greater Dublin area, and it's very very difficult for us to keep an eye on stuff for the rest of the country and 
you know, things um, slightly out of the GDA, um, like Drada and Dundalk, which are in Louth and technically out of our wheelhouse, but obviously we still consider. Um, you know, it's very important that we try and focus um, our sites uh, a bit smaller. So it might be a case of us having splinter groups for Dunlear, Rathdown, Mead, Kildare, the rest of it. So, um, yeah, if you would like to, if you even have the idea of creating your own little um, subgroup of, com of people from your, your local area to cover Dunleary, Rathdown, uh, or Kildare or Wicklow. That's great and you should definitely um, get involved and we'll see how we can facilitate that because it would make our work stronger and it would enable you to um, get more movement in your local area as well. Um, and I'd just like to echo uh, for a third time because um, uh, because we actually don't we don't have a treasurer at the moment and um, nobody on the committee wants to do it. Um, so really, if you um, are impressed by the work we're doing and want to help out and you like doing accounts and that type of thing, uh, there will be very little work involved, uh, but, um, but it would be really great to, if, if somebody uh, was interested or has a bit of experience. And like even, if you, even if you know someone who is a treasurer for another group like this um, that takes membership and membership dues and things like that even if you could just put them onto us and get them to give us some advice that'd be great um, because it's something that we really need to get on top of. Um, okay I think we'll probably uh, finish up with that um, unless anybody from the committee wants to say anything uh, anything final? No? Yeah. Just oh. thanks, thanks everyone for coming. I'm very grateful for all your comments and your questions. Um, probably might, most likely we'll have another one of these before the end of the year. Um, and then maybe another, uh, um, probably two actually, I'd say we could squeeze two in by the end of the year. And hopefully after that, we'll be back to some semblance of normality and can meet in person again. But um, thanks very much. Yeah, and um, uh, also we'll probably be having an AGM um, in October or November who, um, uh, yeah, so again, if you're interested in that, we'll probably be electing people onto the committee and that type of thing. Uh, so thanks uh, very much for coming and uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, and thanks for uh, bearing with all the technical issues and trying to get it set up with Zoom and everything. That was our first time doing that, so. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, all. Bye.